Hello, everyone. My name is Carrie Zhang. I work at um, core service team at Instagram, mainly focusing on data privacy. So this talk, I'll cover the initiative of building a centralized privacy service, the different designs we have explored. And I'll explain in details how the framework works and our way to infer privacy policy. So this is a security and privacy conference. Everybody is an expert of the field. I would like to emphasize that privacy is a core to everything we do at Instagram. Let me start by telling a little story about privacy at Instagram. So jump back in time in 2010, Instagram is an amazing media sharing apps with fancy filters loved by tons of early adopters. Instagram started with two people working day and night on Jungle Stack to build a bunch of endpoints. So we started with supporting two type of account, public account and private account. Public contents are visible to the world, but private contents but contents posted by private accounts are only visible to the followers. Privacy was important from day one and also simple. So we have a simple message which hides the content if the viewer is not a follower. So in just less than two years, in 2012, Instagram has 80 million registered users, 300 million in 2014 and 500 million in 2006. 16, and now currently serving 800 million active users. At the same time, Instagram engineers grow significantly year over year. So what does engineers do? We build lots of features. So we ship countless new features in the past years. I'll name a few that are privacy related. First, hashtag. Hashtag is designed to search and tag contents. But how about private contents that being tagged? They should never show up on the hashtag homepage unless viewer is a follower. Then activity inbox shows the activity of the accounts that you have followed. But let's not forget to hide the activity taken on the private account. Feed and explore. This is an engagement engine for us and drive a lot of the user traffic. We need to make sure that the content are appropriate to the viewer. So it's time to think about age and geogating. So guess what happened to the simple message that which does privacy filtering? This is a pseudo code for what we do for um, activity inbox. I guess it no longer looks simple. So given a list of activities, we need to first make sure that the viewer is still interested in the activity, meaning that he's not blocked or blocked the actioner. Then we, may, may, we need to make sure that the target account is visible, meaning that it's neither private or blocked. The same also apply to media. The viewer has to be able to look at the media. So this message is no longer simple, but this is also not the most difficult part. <coughs> there are privacy checks scat scattered around different endpoints, and we have to keep them in sync. A change in one endpoint may lead to the same change in multiple different endpoints. So if we're not being careful enough, it's possible that the privacy, the privacy rules on notification are different from the media, so that as a result, a user may receive a notification but not able to look at the media. So as Instagram grows, the privacy policy becomes more complicated and synchronization between different features are more difficult. So we need a centralized privacy service. There are many ways of building a centralized privacy service, and we have many explored too. The endpoint level privacy check versus data level privacy check. With the endpoint level design, privacy rules are defined at each endpoint, and privacy checks are done before sending the response to the client. With data level design, privacy checks are explicitly happens explicitly at data fetching level. Any contents that does not pass a privacy check will get filtered out before reaching to the production code. So let me jump into the details. With endpoint level privacy check, developers need to explicitly define what type of contents should get filtered out. It is extremely flexible and clear on what kind of privacy rule on each endpoint, so developer can easily configure different privacy settings on administrative endpoint versus a production endpoint. But the flexibility comes at a cost of high maintenance that the developer need to actually master the privacy settings and make the correct choice. Also, 
filter ranks result might be a problem. For example, on Instagram Explore homepage, it displayed in a grid format of a ranked content. A fixed number of posts are expected to return to the client, so we will have to either overfetch or refetch because it's not easy to estimate how many number of posts that get filtered out by privacy framework. So with data level design, privacy checks are hidden from product code. Privacy checks happen automatically and implicitly. So when developing new features, developer can focus on the business logic. Whatever returns from the data API is already safe. And also, we don't have the overfetching problem. Privacy validated contents are filtered out at the first place so that all the candidates provided to the ranking pipeline shall be already good. The downside of data level privacy check is that the privacy check might happen on every single object fetch. During a feed request, the same user object might have fetched hundreds of times, so building, a, building an appropriate cache is critical. So let's stay back and think about what we are looking for out of a privacy framework. First, it should be correct. It should filter out all privacy violations on all endpoints, meaning that zero privacy incidents on the platform. Next, it should be performant. Any security protection come at a cost. We need to be aware of the price. And third is developer velocity. We want to provide a framework that developer can develop at a high pace without worrying too much about privacy. So let's compare the two approaches. For the endpoint level design, it is flexible, but it is also high maintenance that it relies on the developer to do the correct thing. The overfetch is probably required for ranked data, and it doesn't really help developer velocity because developers still need to master the privacy settings. For data level design, it is enforced everywhere, so it should be low maintenance. And we could resolve the multiple fetch by having a proper cache. And because it is implicit and automatic, so it is risk-free for most of the developers. So with hundreds of engineers at Instagram, we decide to go with data level privacy check for correctness and developer velocity. Data level is a generic term. It includes the data storage, the caching layer, and the API. So where should privacy live in the data level? It could live all the way at the data storage. In this way, it, it protects all the access to the DB. And also, it will be API invariant. Or it could live at the API level to support multiple data storages. In current days, we probably have multiple data fetching API for different languages, and they all need to be privacy aware. So this is probably an open-ended question that is highly coupled with existing data fetching system. We took the second approach for the potential to support multiple data storages. So before we jump into how the framework works, um, let me quickly explain the terminologies we use here. The viewer context describes everything we need to know about the user, like the user ID, the geolocation, the IP. And the privacy rule describes a allow or deny decision based on one privacy scenario. For example, we should deny if the viewer has blocked the user. And the privacy policy describes the allow or deny decision on an object based on a series of privacy scenarios. So a policy is per object base and it consists of a set of privacy rules. So let's look at the implementation of one privacy rule. This is deny if user is blocked rule. Similar with any privacy checks, we need to know first who is a viewer, the viewer contacts, and next, who is, what is the content, the node. The implementation is pretty straightforward. We check if the user has blocked or blocked by the viewer. If this is the case, we deny this access. If not, we continue evaluating the next scenario. So each privacy rule covers one scenario and we group them into a privacy policy. Privacy policy is defined per object. This is a sample object on our user policy. It consists of four rules. 
The rules will be evaluated in the sequential order, and the first allow or deny decision will be the final decision of the privacy check. We started with deny if user blocked rule, followed by user uh, deny if user is gated rule, which handles the age and the geo gating. And then public account should be always visible. If we didn't satisfy any of the condition, we always return deny on the access. We could also build delegation relationship between privacy rules. Delegations happens pretty naturally. For example, if you cannot even look at account, you should not able to see the media or the contents from the account. So this is a simplified version of the privacy policies on media. The deny if media owner rule basically enforce that the parents, which is the media, has to be loadable by the viewer. Otherwise, the, deny, the access will be denied. With the ability of building delegation hierarchy, it makes privacy logic much simpler. Privacy rules should not limit it to object and contents, but also on relationships. So we call edge pri privacy. There are cases where you can see two ends of the connection, but the connection itself is secretive. An Instagram example would be you can save any media as your favorite media. The media itself can be public or private, but who have saved this media as a favorite should remain as a secret. Few privacy. Personal identifiable information should have a tighter restriction to prevent leakage. You probably can find any celebrity on Instagram, but you cannot find their email address. Field privacy added a finer granularity on private field on an object. There are many PII sensitive fields, and we cannot expect the developer to know all of them. So having a separate and stricter field policy makes the access explicit, thus reduce the chance of leakage. So deploy privacy related changes are always risky because we could never have unit test that covers all the privacy scenarios. I would like to share the lessons I have learned, we have learned along the way. First of all, focus on the core types. With any content sharing application, users on contents are probably responsible for most of the data access and the privacy issues. On Instagram, we started with user, media, and comment. The existing type already have privacy checks scattered around the code base, so the first set of privacy rules are based on the existing logic. During the deployment, we keep the existing code to make sure that the privacy check is only straighter or equal comparing to the existing ones. We lock, compare, and make change until there's no discrepancy. Secondly, always keep an eye on performance. During the initial de development we deployment, we have a performance penalty of having both existing checks and the new framework in place. But once the migration is over and we remove the old privacy checks, the regression is resolved. Also, with data level privacy checks, privacy checks happen on sin every single object batch. So we really need to look out for performance all the time. <coughs> We need to optimize the engine and build the appropriate cache. Any security prevention come at a cost. So after tons of optimization, we finally at a good stage now. So now every new features are built on top of privacy framework and every new object types added come with a privacy rule. But Instagram is big now. We have hundreds of data types and we have many teams and we have a large code base. By having a centralized effort from the data privacy team means that we know the privacy framework really well, but we don't really know the, the usage of each object types. So although we don't understand the exact business logic behind all the data types, but we know all the data access per endpoint. So we could sample data access per endpoint and build a relationship graphs between the viewer and data. A very simple example would be user preference. So on any endpoints, only the user itself should be able to access the preference. 
So with hundreds of data types on Instagram, we want an automated way to build a relationship graph and analyze common relationships. So this table roughly shows how the system works. We are building the relationship graph for device object. We lock the device, the viewer, the owner, and the endpoints of all the device object data access. Of course, in production, we sample much, our samples, our data set is much larger than what is shown on the table. So with, with a reasonable data set, you can see that in most of the cases, the viewer is actually the owner. So we can conclude the relationship of this device object that we should have a privacy rule. We should allow the access if the viewer is the owner. But of course, there are exceptions. From the last entry, you can see the viewer is not. So if 99% of the endpoints satisfy a certain relationship, but just one or two does not, then probably there's something going on with the endpoint implementation. So this is also a way to flag discrepancies through data access. The relationship can be much more complicated as we add more relationships such as creator, follower, or blocker. So to recap, we pick the data level privacy checks for correctness and developer velocity. If you have a big enough engineering team, consider adopt data level privacy check. It provides a very free framework so that the engineers feel confident about developing at a high pace. And also synchronization between different features have become a lot easier. Building the framework is important. At the same time, find an automatic way to infer policies and flag detections because code is never perfect. That's it.